Welcome to Uprising, Rula Jabril. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. So first, uh, tell us a little bit about the book that you wrote, Miral, and its basis on uh, on the stories in your own life. I, I want to talk about the political situation in Palestine right now, particularly with some of the news that's been coming out of there. But uh, let's first get personal. How did you write this story, Miral? How much of it is based on your own personal experiences? It's 100% based on my personal experience. It's the life I lived in the in the Middle East, in, in Jerusalem, uh, West Bank, Israel. Um, in 2003, I was the first uh, anchor woman that come from in Italy that uh, had a political TV show. And my publisher came to me and I said, well, would like to talk about your success. How can a foreign person, a woman, become an established anchor woman and a political analyst? And I thought, you know, in that moment, I thought that my country went backwards. And there was a second intifada, the, upri- the second uprising. And I lived the first intifada as a teenager. And I thought we achieved peace in a way by understanding and by um, committing to a real solution, political solution, by giving the Palestinian 22% of the land. Seven years later, um, actually immediately, more or less, some years later, Rabin was killed, Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, the violence... There was an escalation of violence that led to the Second Intifada and the building of settlements. So all of that, I just wanted to remember that we had a historical moment, one of the greatest moments in our country, where both sides, 80, 80% of the Israelis and the Palestinians, were to port peace. And how, by not implementing the accords, we went backwards and the violence became the protagonist in my country. I wanted to remember those moments. But to tell the story of my country, I decided to tell actually my story and the story of my family. I thought it was a small window to see the big window and the big picture of my country. So who does the character of Miral represent? It's, it represents me in a way, who I was as a teenager in the Middle East, but it represents also uh, the hope and the dreams that many Girls, many Palestinian girls, teenagers, were living what well, they were living in that period of time between 1987 and 1993, which is the first Intifada. Uh, it's their their uh, passion. Uh, this is Mira is what you see in Tahrir Square today. Mm. The Egyptian women, the Tunisian women, the Libyan women that they went in the street that they asked for freedom, for democracy, for life with dignity. This is what you see. What happened in Tahrir Square is what happened in Palestine in 1987. That's the same call. That's the same uh, kind of passion and the same kind of civil action where takes people to the streets saying, you know what, no more regimes. We don't want strong men. What we said in 1987, we don't want military presence inside of our lives, our homes, and our future. Mm. So you write about Miral, uh, who represents what you went through as a young yes. girl, somebody who was just really understanding politi- you know, politics, what, what the impacts of politics are, what the impacts of leaders are, and expressing a frustration to do something about what she saw around her. Can you share with us a little bit of your political evolution as a teenager, what you went through in your mind as how problems such as what we're seeing in in the Palestinian territories can be solved? Well, what I saw as a teenager when when, uh, my teacher and my mentor, Hind Husseini, sent us to the refugee camps because the schools were closed and her motto is, we need education for this country. We need future leaders to be educated, well-read, and to be open-minded. So that can lead, lead them to be critical thinkers and tolerant, especially tolerant. And women were you know, she believed in women and women's rights. So she sent us to the refugee camps. I went to the Al Amari refugee camp near Ramallah. And what I saw there in terms of desperation, in terms of um, lack of rights, there was no rights. They ceased to be human beings in the eyes of the Israelis. So what I saw there in the kind of hu- daily humiliation, the, the s- uh, oppression, the, the the racism that they were subjected to is actually what fed the violence mm. and what it became uh, it became the the base for extremists to to grow up and become stronger uh, you know bin laden was killed and but we don't realize that his uh, ideology was built 
and found ground in the Arab world because of the injustice that was there, because of the regimes that were putting there. He you often know, cited the Palestinian occupation, Israeli often occupation. Often cited the Palestinian, uh, you know, the, the, the also said that he speaks in the name of Palestinians. He didn't speak in the name of anybody. Uh, he, the issue is, is there was a sentiment uh, within in the Arab world of injustice, of the injustice policy of United States and Israel, and the fact that uh, United States always back Israel no matter what, what problems, what uh, abuse they will, uh, abuse of power they will uh, practice towards the Palestinians. That kind of things is what make these extremists powerful and strong, and they become, uh, they, you know, but, but if you think about it, bin Laden in so many years never managed to achieve anything with violence, never. Who achieved anything these days are women and men in Tahrir Square, in Cairo, in Tunisia, that went with non-violence revolution, saying, you know what, we stand up against you, Mubarak, we stand up against you, Ben Ali, we stand against Gaddafi, and we need our life back. We, we want to be protagonists in our own countries. Th these are the people that toppled these dictators. These are the, th the same words that Palestinians used in 1987. These are the words that I used in many manifestations, saying, no more military presence because the more they are there the more extremes will become powerful and the more you know weakened we will be as civil society mm. when you wrote the book how did you decide how to portray the thought processes of your characters um, who you know go through the gamut of human emotions and in reacting to the Israeli occupation the horrors of occupation your novel starts quite early on uh, beyond 1948 even and uh, you know you can sense the evolution of people the disbelief that people feel when they realize that what is happening is becoming semi-permanent. So how did you sort of decide how to express those emotions that, that people, that your characters were going I through? went to my memory. These are my, my thoughts, but also they are my memories. As a teenager, as, uh, as, a, as a child, you know, I never recall me being a child playing in the grounds. I never recall myself. I never really had the innocence of a child. My mother died when I was five years old. She committed suicide because her stepfather uh, sexually abused her. And from that moment, I became the mother of my sister. In that moment, I became a writer. Books saved my life. My father, who loved me unconditionally, gave me that tool to understand that through education, through books, I can really have a way of seeing life and see that there is happiness and there is uh, th there's other ways of surviving a struggle. If we give the kids in refugee camps, if we give the kids in desperate areas in Africa or in Pakistan and Afghanistan, that tool of education, and we give them novels to read, literature, books, stories, they can, in a way, uh, exchange the bad memories that they have, uh, that they come from the, from the conflict, the violence that they see, the abuse, the harassment, all of that. They can, in a way, substitute that with good memories that they can read in their books. They can start dreaming. Mm -hmm. They can. Uh, that's what led me to write what I wrote. My feelings are true, and they are still inside of me. There are traumas that I'm handling till today. But the way I went out of it is by writing this book. My guest is Rula Jabril. She is the author of the novel Miral, based on her own life. She's also a political analyst. The novel has been made into a film uh, by the same name. Now, tell us about Hind Husseini, the woman who ran the orphanage that you, uh, the, the woman who's also a character in your book around the orphanage that you uh, went to. Well, she was a very, very strong woman and very open-minded. She came from a very wealthy family, and she was a teacher. In 1948, she was walking in the streets, April 10th, and she was going to a meeting with the governor of Jerusalem, Al-Khatib, and the war started the night before, and there was an emergency with the refugees. So what she did is... Going to that meeting, she met in her way 55 children. They were the survivors of a massacre uh, of a village called Der Yassin. There were 55. The smallest one was two. The biggest one was 10. She decided not to go anymore to the meeting, take them home with her. And from that day, her home became an orphanage. I arrived to that orphanage in 1978 when I was five years old. And she was my mother, my mentor. She was the one that made me believe, gave me the confidence to believe that I can achieve anything 
through nonviolence, through education. She made us believe that we can change the course of history in our countries. We have the power to do that if we believe in what we are doing, if we work hard and study harder. Um, the kind of dignity that she um, she had and, and, and uh, the fact that she never stopped working her entire life for these children she would go to the to the villages and collect these children even from children that were not orphans but the, their parents were so poor she would tell tell them you know what i'll take care of your kids come visit them in the weekends but let me take care of their education that was who she was mm -hmm. she was a hero mm -hmm. uh, what is the uh, analogy to tahrir square in palestine you know what Hindi used to say, and um, it's something that um, actually it's not her quote, but she really she loved this quote. She said, "We cannot um, keep peace with force. You can achieve peace only by understanding." And she kept on saying that. The analogy is very similar. One day, nations. After 30 years of regime or 40 years of military occupation or 60 years, one day they will stand up and say, enough. We will not bend down our heads anymore. We want freedom, no matter what. You know, one of the taxi drivers, um, that uh, Egyptian taxi driver, he went to Tahrir Square and he was not left or right. He never voted. He was so ignorant. He just had a family. And when he saw that um, a man put, you know, just burning himself in Tunisia against the regime because they oppressed him so much to the level that he had no choice except die because that's the option that you have in, in, in the Arab world in certain under certain regimes. Either you leave or you die because there's, there's no future left. And uh, so that guy went to Tahrir Square and he said, you know what, I will stay in Tahrir Square until either I die or Mubarak step down. He's a hero of that revolution. This is what we said when I was 16 year old. We, we used to go to, to the refugee camp and say, we will stay here in these uh, squares, in these streets, until the militaries will leave our land or we will die here. We were ready, ready to die. I have many, many friends that were imprisoned or tortured or they were killed by the Israelis. In the end, we had a great prime minister, the prime minister of Israel, and who's Yitzhak Rabin, who decided one day that violence is not only not the answer, but it will destroy the Palestinians and will destroy the, the spirit of the Israel state. We need to decide either it has to be a democracy, which means a country for everybody, one country where we all have the same rights, or it has to be two state solutions. But that means that every outpost, military outpost or settlements has to leave immediately. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned about the state of Israel because with what's happening around us, Israel used to say we are the only democracy in the Middle East, the only and real democracy. It's true, but only for Israelis. Now you have mo democratic movements all around the Arab world. You need to talk to them, understand them, and understand that their aspiration for freedom is real and true and will stay there. And you can befriend them, actually. Well, speaking of uh, democracy, in the Palestinian territories in recent uh, weeks, we've heard of a, an agreement between uh, Hamas and Fatah that uh, was reached. And this is the third time that they've come to an agreement, but there's been a lot of infighting between these two factions. But uh, the, is uh, the United States and Israel reacted to this news with dismay and, uh, and have condemned uh, any kind of a relationship or cooperation between Hamas and Fatah, whereas uh, many believe that uh, unless you have that cooperation, there cannot be real democracy inside uh, the Palestinian territory territories. You what know, you there's two things happening. One, May 15, there's a recall for a third intifada. And third intifada will be against three things, against the corruption of the Palestinian Authority, the President Abu Mazen, against the military presence of the Israelis in within the West Bank, the Israeli occupation, and against Hamas. But there's one thing that we need to acknowledge as we can never achieve peace with one element. We have to include all the elements in the table, even Hamas. You know, nobody is talking clearly. We managed the United States, Obama administration, who are really respect for their foreign policy, except the middle, except 
Israeli-Palestinian issue. They managed to kill bin Laden simply because they negotiated also with the Taliban. You cannot achieve certain things without negotiating with all the elements on the tables. They've been negotiating with the Taliban. Karzai himself been negotiating with the Taliban. They've been talking also to the secret, the, to the Pakistani secret service. Without the collaboration of the Pakistani secret service, there was no way that you can get to bin Laden. No way. But what happened was clear. The Obama administration went to these countries and included them in the war on terror. And it also, they showed them understanding. They showed them respect. You cannot force this process without showing respect to the Palestinian people, telling them that you understand their rights and their aspiration for freedom. And you talk whoever is in front of you. And whoever is, you know, Hamas is not monolithical. It's, it's, it's a, yes, it's a movement. It's, it's, it used terror and it's wrong. It used violence and it's wrong. But it has two sides, the military side and the, the, um, and the so political mm-hmm. side. You need to divide them. You need to understand that you can talk with the political side. I interviewed Hania and Duwake more than once. And I have well, to tell you, leader Hamas, major yeah. leaders in Hamas. I never interviewed Mashal, who's in, in, um, in um, Syria. But when you talk to these people, you, can, you understand in that moment that, yes, these people can be reasonable. And it's not true that their aspiration is to talk all, take over Israel and destroy that. It's, the truth is th- that's not true. What they want is a real Palestinian state for, for the Palestinians. But you can actually destroy Hamas. And uh, how, how you can do it is not by violence and not by d- demonizing them, by a real democratic movement. And what I mean is allow the Palestinians to have their, their rights. And in that moment, the Palestinians themselves will not choose Hamas and will choose an alternative Hamas. Hmm. Well, finally, Rula, how do you respond to the perhaps inevitable allegations that the film that your partner Julian Schnabel made based on your book is simply anti-Israel propaganda? Well, I'm sure that the people that say these things never saw the book, never saw the movie, or they never read the book, mm-hmm. because it's against violence no matter what, where it comes from. Uh, in the movie and in the book, I portray violence as wrong, deeply wrong, coming from each side. You know, when you see a Palestinian man harassing sexually and raping his stepdaughter, is that good for a Palestinian image? No, but it's true, and it happened. Does that portray the Palestinian in a good eye? You see Palestinians killing other Palestinians because they consider them collaborators. Is that good? No. Military occupation is a monster. How can you say? uh, So the problem is me because I'm talking about the military occupation and the disaster situation that it creates in Israel and in Palestine. Or the problem is that it exists, that this problem exists in 60 years and is actually eating up the real the real spirit of the Israeli states and it's destroying any potential of modernism of of uh, becoming tolerant and and modern and and uh, free for Palestinian people mm-hmm. if you don't understand this you can you know whenever you mention anything any simple criticism toward Israel they will accuse you of anti-semitism or anti-israeli david gordon um said some ye- some weeks ago, uh, um, Gaza is an open air prison. Immediately, he was accused of being anti semit and anti Israeli. And wha- you know, we need to understand that only criticism can make us improve. When you criticize Obama or when we criticize the Bush administration, we were not accused of being anti American. Maybe some of us during maybe the the early days of the war in Iraq. But the truth is. That kind of criticism is what makes any government better, what improves them, what pushes them to understand that they are doing the wrong things. I I was raised in a free way. I was raised under military occupation, but my mind and my spirit will always stay free. I went to Europe, I studied, and what I do all my life is to hold up a mirror towards the power economic power or political power show them what is wrong how wrong is this picture and i'm showing my country from both sides how wrong violence can be and how this is destroying actually the dream of israel to have a real state julian schnabel is a jewish director his mother had a dream to have and you know to have a real democratic free states for the israelis but that includes also arabs to to have where arabs that have full rights He's following his mother's dream. He's, he's, you know what, he's protecting that kind of dream. Hmm. What will destroy eventually 
Israel will not be this kind of movie and books. It's to be blind to the suffering of the Palestinians. Well, on that note, Rula Jabril, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Is there a website that you recommend or any other information where listeners can get more uh, info? Well, uh, the website of Miral is available and, and the Facebook and um, and actually one of the most beautiful. I, I love democracy now mm-hmm. and watch democracy now every day. I think we need to be informed in this country. This is the country that is the most entertained and the less informed. We need to know what's going on around us in the world, especially in this historic moment, especially now. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.